His Excellency is coming. Good morning, gentlemen, ladies, good people, our United States of America. The instance for a new election of a citizen to administer our executive branch of government being not far removed, I thought at this time it proper that I apprise you of a decision that I had reached, not without some mature reflection. And that is that my name shall not be amongst the number from whom your choice shall be made. I have long hoped that I might be allowed to return to that peaceable retirement from which I had been so reluctantly drawn. But the confused and perplexed state of our affairs, both domestic and abroad, have caused me to forego my own personal preferences. Stepping away as I now do from the public stage, I cannot fail but look with gratitude upon the many honors that you have placed upon my brow and the continuing support that you as a people have given me. We are taught by the ancients that there is no greater honor that any man may hope to achieve than recognition by his neighbors and virtuous countrymen for service to his nation. And so for that recognition, I am certainly grateful. And perhaps here I ought to stop. But my continuing concern for your happiness and felicity as a people causes me to wish to share with you certain opinions that I have come to. Remarks which I hope will be received by you, not as coming from the President of these United States of America, but rather simply the words of a departing friend, who cannot hope for any personal gain by having shared them with you. In these last several years, we've all learned to look upon the union of our states with great love and affection. And so it should be. A country which protects your rights and liberties, it has the right to concentrate your affections. There is no greater honor that may be bestowed upon you than your title of American, which is your title in your national capacity. A title which serves to stir the truly patriotic heart far more than any honors which may be given by mere regional distinction. We're all with little difference quite similar. We worship the same God. We speak the same language. We enjoy the same political principles and customs. The independence and liberty, which is now ours, is the result of joint efforts, joint struggles, joint disappointments, and joint successes. Sixteen states, all, pulling against one another. And every one of them tugging against the federal head will certainly bring upon us our ruin. That is as clear to me as ever was the sun in its meridian brightness. Whereas a wise and liberal constitution, closely watched and guarded to prevent encroachment, that gives us every reason to suppose we might obtain that level of dignity and respect that we had every promise of achieving. In these last several years, we've all been made witnesses of most novel and astonishing of spectacles, of an entire people gathered together peacefully to determine for themselves under what form of government they believe they will live most happy. The people of our United States have gathered and with mature deliberation have created a new written constitution far superior to its predecessor. One that provides for a balance of its powers and allows for its own amendment. In truth, it may well be said that the most important of all of our political principles and customs is this ability to amend our systems of government. But let us always remember that just as with any other human institution, that time and experience are just as necessary to determine the usefulness of governments and constitutions. Let us never enter into alteration or change simply for the want of innovation or novelty. I do not suppose that any of these words I have shared with you will long be remembered. If they occasionally come to mind to serve to protect our nation from false patriotism, or the spirit and fury of party politics, or to leave us disengaged in foreign intrigues, then I for one will certainly be satisfied. 
Whether or not I've been guided by these maxims myself these last eight years, I believe the public record will answer. But let me affirm to you all here and now that I have always at least considered myself guided by them. But I am full aware of my own shortcomings. I imagine I must have committed many errors. I beseech the Almighty to reduce whatever evils those errors may tend towards, and I hope that you, the people, when you look upon them, that you will do so with indulgence. With the knowledge that any errors I may have committed had never been from a, a malignancy of my heart, but rather simply a want of talent equal to the zealousness of my patriotism. I look forward now to stepping away from the public stage, taking my place alongside you as a common citizen in a free and independent United States of America. I believe that we are all from here forward to be viewed as players on our most conspicuous of stages. One that seems destined by providence for displays of human greatness and felicity. Our systems of government, they're not perfect. That no more perfect government could possibly have been created at this epoch. And I do not doubt that there may be promises put forth that we as a people have yet to achieve. But see, that is now our responsibility together as citizens of a free nation to make good upon these unanswered promises. And I, for one, take strength in my knowledge that Providence, after having already carried us and delivered us to numerous dangers and hazards, does not now intend to leave its work undone. But to rely alone on providence, without exerting ourselves to the utmost, that will serve little save to tempt providence. We're reminded in that excellent play Cato by Mr. Addison that mortals cannot command success, but we can do something more important. We can attempt to be worthy of success. Let us continue.